We need to separate out the distinction between fantasy and delusion. You do have a fantasy about the future, so you have to provisionally map the future. That's what a plan is. That doesn't make it a delusion. Like, it becomes a delusion when the map bears no relationship to the underlying territory. So if you have a strategy for the future, you know, maybe let's say that your strategy for the future is that you have 5 million YouTube subscribers in three years. Well, you have no evidence of the strict sort that that's how it's going to be because anything could happen between now and three years from now, let's say. But there's no reason to call that a delusion. It's one hypothetically possible path of potential. And then you can make the sacrifices necessary to bring that about. So even though it's a fantasy because it maps something that isn't there, it's not a delusion. It's a delusion when you're ignoring elements of your own experience that would inform your fantasy more effectively. You're ignoring them so that you can live in a positive representation of the future without having to pay the appropriate price for it. The ultimate ideal is also the ultimate judge because the ultimate ideal is something against which you fall far short. And that might be so painful that you can barely stand it. But then what you do is you, two things, I suppose, is you lower the ideal and you raise your estimation of your potential. And what do I mean by lower the ideal? Well, if you're comparing yourself to someone or even to a future self, and the gap is so painful that it paralyzes you, then you've created a dragon that you don't have the tools to master. And so what you have to do is you have to scale the dragon down to size. And you want to scale the dragon down to size until it's a size that you are willing to move toward, however small that is. Now, you know, if you're here and your ideal is here and that gap is unbearable, then you reduce the gap and you reduce the gap. And you're going to have to do that anyways, because you're not going to move from where you are to perfect in one fell swoop, right? There's going to be incremental steps. So you have to fill in that, that hierarchy of progression with a high enough resolution representation so that you can start to move forward. There's another gospel comment that's very interesting. It's called the Matthew Principle. And the Matthew Principle is, to those who have everything, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, everything will be taken. Now, it's brutal because it implies that reality works like this. When you're moving up, you go like this, right? And that's pretty nice. That's a lot better than this. But when you're going down, you go like that, right? It's like downhill, downhill cliff. Okay, so you want to avoid the downhill path. Well, if the uphill path is like this, which is like exponential, let's say, or geometric, then what that means is that it doesn't matter how big the first steps you take uphill are. Even if they're trivial, even if they're shameful in their size, because you're so useless, if you're disciplined in that, you'll speed up extraordinarily rapidly. And so that's the good news, you might say, is that you can take very small steps, even ones that might be shameful in their size, and you have to admit that to yourself. But once you get the ball rolling, it doesn't roll in a linear fashion. It rolls in a geometric fashion. And this is a really good thing to know because it can take the sting out of the realization of your own stupidity. It's like, yeah, you know, everybody has their weak sides, let's say, things they're embarrassed about. When I first started going to the gym, I was like 23, and I think I weighed 135 pounds, and I was six foot one, very, very thin, 27 inch waist, something like that. And I smoked like mad, and I drank too much, like I wasn't in good shape. <laughs> the first attempts forward I took in the gym, I went to this swim exercise class. Jesus, it was me and this like really fat guy, young guy, probably not in any worse shape than me, and like seven old women over 70, and they could outswim me. Like it was pretty damn humiliating. And so I did a semester of that and got myself in somewhat better shape. And then I started to go to the gym to work out, to lift weights. And that was also rough because, you know, I'd be underneath the bloody bench press trying to lift 75 pounds off the rests. And, you know, some muscle headed bastard would come over and tell me how to do it. And it's like, yeah, thank you. But you know, it's embarrassing and lots of times people won't do things like go to the gym because they're so embarrassed about how they look or what sort of shape they're in. And it's a pain to start at the bottom, but you start at the bottom where you're weak. And if you want to rectify what's weak, you have to accept the fact that you're at the bottom and that the first steps are going to be painful. You know, it took me about three years, but I stopped smoking and then I stopped drinking and I gained 
40 pounds of muscle in like three and a half years, something like that. I basically had to stop doing that because I had to eat like six times a day. It was crazy. But I got a lot more physically confident and a lot more coordinated. But the point of all this is if you're going to rectify your weaknesses, you have to admit your insufficiency to your own shame. Now, if the gap between you and your ideal is so great that it paralyzes you, you shrink that. Things will beckon to you and call to you, and you'll have intuitions about which pathway to take. And you will, in all likelihood, follow those, because what else do you have? You have these orienting instincts. This is another reason why you don't lie, because if you lie and you practice lying, you pathologize your instincts, and then your intuitions lead you wrong. And so there's a sin that's laid out in the Gospels. It's the sin against the Holy Ghost, and it's unforgivable. And people have been debating for like, 2,000 years about what this particular sin is, but it's something like the pathologization of the instincts that orient you. Like if you sacrifice your relationship to the truth, you warp your vision, and then you can't see. And then one day it'll be dark, and there'll be sharp things in the fog in front of you, and you'll wander right into them because you've pathologized your own vision. Yeah. You, d you don't want to lie because you program yourself falsely, and then you automatically see what isn't there. And then, of course, the world will slap you in the face continually, and you'll think, oh my God, the world's such a pathological place, when the truth of the matter is, is that, no, you just keep running into things that you refuse to see. And then you think, well, the world's made of nothing but obstacles. It's like, well, you put the obstacles in your own path, and you did that by developing these complex self-serving delusions, a story that you tell other people about who you are that isn't true. You're trying to lay out a map that bears no relationship to reality and you keep wondering why you wander off the path and into a pit. It's like, well, how could it be otherwise? People have commented to me many times about my bravery and I, I, I don't like that. It's, it's not right. I'm afraid of different things than the typical person. Maybe that's a good way of thinking about it. I'm way more afraid of the consequences of saying something that's false or wandering off the appropriate path than I am of whatever consequences might come for saying what I believe and doing what I believe to be the case. I'm way more afraid of that. You know, I've been reading the Gospel of St. Matthew. I'm, I'm writing a book at the moment called We Who Wrestle With God, and one of the things Christ says to people continually is to not damage their vision, is to not put, that's the best way of putting it, don't occlude your eye. You can see what's in front of you if you're willing to see it. And if you're willing to see it, many of the terrible obstacles in life, you can just walk around. But if you blind yourself purposefully to follow your own narrow, self-serving delusion, you're going to run into terrible things and terrible people and the terrible part of your own soul all the time. That's what you should be afraid of. You can't be isolated, alone, without responsibility, and pursuing your hedonistic nonsense, and not be insane and miserable. Those are all the same thing, right? And so, you know, it's got to the point, I've, I've said things that have made me somewhat unpopular, like it's very difficult for people to mature until they have a child. You find a huge part of what you are in that relationship. It makes you responsible, makes you grow up. It gives you the opportunity to mentor someone. You have someone around who's more important than you. Well, that's part of being mentally healthy. It's a huge part of it. This enterprise that I've helped put together, Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, we're trying to put forward a model of governance. It's called a subsidiary model. And the idea is that people have multiple social roles that scale. You know, there's you. You should take care of yourself. Integrate yourself, which means you can conduct yourself properly across the medium to long run. You're self-sustaining. Then you can maybe extend that to your partner and then to your family and then to your local community and then to broader communities as you become more and more competent and able to take on that responsibility. That's the alternative to isolated hedonic slavery. You slave to your own whims. And it's the alternative to tyranny because if you take on all that responsibility, you don't have any need for someone to govern you. It's truly the case that your sanity is the concordance between you as an individual and the world. That's the sanity. You're distributed out into the world. 
and you should be, and that's, you want to be. That's where the adventure is. You want to be solipsistic? The solipsistic porn masturbator. <laughs> Jesus, it's not going to be aimless and miserable. Well, God, it's so pathetic. Why am I so unhappy? It's because you think about yourself. All the, no, you think about the lowest impulses in yourself all the time. That's why you're miserable.